Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion on Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century. This is the first in a sequence of videos summarizing key texts in the natural and social sciences, in this case, economics. I hope that these videos will provide a concise exposition of the key ideas in these texts and will be of interest to the general public. So who is Thomas Piketty? He is a French economist born in 1971. He received his PhD at a very young age of 22 from the London School of Economics. Immediately after, he became assistant professor at MIT from 1993 to 95, and eventually achieved tenure at a university in Paris at the age of 29. He specializes in economic inequality and economic history, and is the author of the bestsellers Capital in the 21st Century and Capital in Ideology. So why is this book important? This book concerns the nature of growing wealth inequality for the last 150 odd years. Even though the book is entitled Capital in the 21st Century, this book primarily covers capital in the late 19th century in the 20th century, as well as some modest projections of the future of wealth inequality in the 21st century. This book is based on 15 years of research from 1998 to 2013, and its intention is to understand the mechanisms underlying the distribution of income and wealth inequality in specifically developed societies. He draws upon historical research and accounting records to support his points, and discusses data sets that were seldom discussed by economic historians prior. For example, the unearthment of French estate records for example, we see that the share of total income in the United States possessed by the top 1% has increased roughly linearly from that of the mid-1970s to that of 2012. We also see that minimum wage in the United States has remained roughly constant from that of 3 euros in 1950 to that of only 6 euros in 2012 and 13. We also see that, by way of contrast, France has increased its minimum wage significantly since the 1950s. In this graph, we see that the inheritance flow in Europe declined from roughly 1900 to the post-war period, but then has been increasing roughly linearly from that of 1970 to the present. And we also see that the gross total number of world billionaires from 1987 to 2013 has also been increasing from that of approximately 300 to that of nearly 5,500. In attempting to provide an explanation for these phenomena, Piketty makes 10 claims throughout his book. First is that there was a relative scarcity of data on wealth inequality prior to the mid-20th century. For example, there were many 19th century economists like David Ricardo, Thomas Malthus, and Karl Marx, who relied heavily upon fragments of data sets in Europe to support their theories. But they were only fragments. For instance, Malthus claimed that rapid population growth entails low wages and high land rent. Marx claimed that either the tendency for the rate of profit to fall would be so great, such that capitalism would combust, or capital's share of national income would increase indefinitely via infinite accumulation. We'll discuss a bit later what exactly that means. Simon Kuznets's share of upper income groups in income and savings, 1953, was, according to Piketty, the very first attempt to measure social inequality on such an ambitious scale. This is largely due to tax records that were available to the United States since 1913, which is the initial date of income tax being imposed in the United States. Much of this information was available, for example, in abundance from French government records, given that since the 1790s, the French government had retained wealth records astonishingly modern and comprehensive for its time. The revolution is the reason why French estate records are probably the richest in the world over the long run. Income tax acts soon were passed in Denmark in 1870, Japan 1887, Prussia 1891, Sweden 1903, Britain 1909, US 1913 with South Africa the same year, France 1914, India 1922, and Argentina as late as 1932. As Piketty writes, before the requirement to declare one's income, people were often unaware of the amount of their own income. The same is true of the corporate tax and wealth tax. Taxation is not only a way of requiring all citizens to contribute to the financing of public expenditures, it's also a useful way for establishing classifications and promoting knowledge, as well as democratic transparency. The income tax rates from 1900 to 2013 are roughly hill-shaped. That is, they peak around the 1950s to 1980s and then decline from the 1980s onwards. As you can see here from this graph as well, you can see that Britain had as high as 98% on its top marginal tax rate, a historical absolute high. The third claim Piketty advances in his book is rather technical. It is the claim that R is strictly greater than G. So what does R and G mean in this case? R stands for the rate of return on capital, and it's supposed to be greater than the rate of return on income. So in this case, capital is defined as the sum total of non-human assets that can be owned in exchange in some market. We'll talk later about the slave trade. For now, let's focus on national income. National income is defined as GDP minus depreciation of capital. So in this case, beta is equal to R over G, that is the capital income ratio. So in 2010, France, Britain, Germany, Italy, the US, and Japan witnessed private wealth amounting to about 150,000 euros per capita. That's just on average. That's not to say that the variance of the distribution does not depend on these countries. Whereas national income corresponded to 30,000 euros per capita, introducing a beta value of 5, or about 
Having introduced this formalism, he introduces what he calls the first fundamental law of capitalism. That is, alpha is equal to r times beta, where here r is the rate of return on capital, beta is the capital income ratio, alpha the share of income from capital in national income. So here's just a concrete example to walk you through this. Letting beta equal 500%, and assuming realistically that the rate of return on capital is about 3% per annum, then alpha in this case is going to be equal to 15%. So you might ask, well, why is a rate of return on capital of 3% realistic? Well, a typical large apartment in Paris in 2010 is valued at 1 million euros and typically rents for 2,500 euros per month or 30,000 euros per annum, approximately 3% rate of return on capital. The capital income ratio beta is argued to remain at 700% for both Britain and France from the period 1700 to 1914, crashing suddenly down to 300% in 1920, given the devastation of World War I. From here, there was then a linear growth in beta to 2010's value of 500% for Britain and 600% for France. From 1700 to 1720, public debt reached 50% of national income in Britain and France due to the financing of wars against one another and against others. Lack of ability to finance these wars was due to weak taxation policies. French public debt was 80% of national income in 1913, yet public debt was as low as 30% in 1950 right after World War II. French inflation was as high as 50% from 45 to 48, weakening purchasing power and thus reducing debt in real terms. Britain witnessed public debt of 200% of GDP in 1950, and yet inflation in the 1950s, approximately 4% per annum plus higher inflation of 15%, drove real public debt down to around 50% of GDP. What tends to cause inflation in public debt? Well, wars. The world wars reduced wealth inequalities, the fifth claim Piketty makes in his book. The value of beta of Germany in the period 1870 to 2010 is roughly similar in its trajectory to that of Britain and France, sitting at 600 and 700% from 1870 till 1910, but declined sharply to 300% in the 1940s, and linearly rising to just about 400% now in 2010. Largely because of the devastation of World War I and World War II, and the lack of an extensive colonial empire, hyperinflation rose in 1923 in Germany, decimating its public debt of 100% of GDP, down to 20% in 1950. In an attempt to provide an even more robust theoretical explanation for this, Piketty introduces his sixth claim, that is the second fundamental law of capitalism. This law states that beta is equal to S over G, where S is the savings rate and G here is the growth of national income. Savings is defined as net of capital of depreciation, since there's always going to be wear and tear on factory machinery parts, etc., since savings have to finance this wear and tear. Secondly, savings does not include durable goods, such as furniture, cars, home appliances like a refrigerator, etc., since these represented most 15,000 euros per capita of national income in the early 2010s, compared to overall private wealth being about 150,000 to 200,000 euros per person, half of which is in mostly in real estate and net financial assets, these kinds of things. If you find this too abstract, consider the following concrete example. So suppose that the savings rate is 10%, G is equal to 2%, then beta will equal to 500%. So if a country saves 10% of its national income every year, and the rate of growth of its income is over 2% per annum, which is pretty typical of developed societies, then the long-run capital income ratio is equal to 500%. There's a hidden assumption in Piketty's model he doesn't quite discuss explicitly, which is that G is actually a function of population size. So to kind of quote a passage in which I figured this out, it follows immediately that a country that has near zero demographic growth, and therefore a total growth rate close to 1.5%, can expect to accumulate a capital stock worth six to eight years of national income, Whereas a growth rate of 2.5%, as in the United States, will accumulate a capital stock worth only three to four years of national income. How does the second law relate to the history of wealth inequality? Well, consider a theory of Karl Marx's, which we discussed earlier. Karl Marx believed in the following disjunctive proposition. He claimed either there's a tendency for the rate of profit to fall given capital depreciation, or capitalists will infinitely accumulate capital. So here's something to kind of explain the logic in a bit more detail here. If the capitalist saves in order to increase their power, then beta tends towards infinity. This means that alpha is equal to r cross beta, which is equal to r cross s over g, given the second law of capitalism, which gets large. And so the share of income from capital increases and the share of income from labor decreases, leading to either a proletarian revolution or hyper-exploitation. This is just Marxist theory. This isn't even Piketty's theory. In fact, Piketty actually disagrees with many of these claims. The point, rather, is that as R gets closer to zero, given that capital depreciates over time, that we can provide a model of wealth inequality. So in this case, Piketty is positing the first and second laws of capitalism, 
and yet disagreeing with the kinds of conclusions that can be drawn from this, such as in the case of Karl Marx. The seventh claim Piketty makes in his book is that the slave trade drove U.S. wealth inequality. This is perhaps unsurprising given the nature of slavery. Nonetheless, the data is very interesting that he describes. Thomas Jefferson, for example, owned about 600 slaves and signed legislation in 1808 ending the importation of slaves to U.S. territory. However, this did not in any way mitigate slave purchases, rising from 400,000 domestically in 1770s to more than a million in 1800, reaching heights as even as high as 4 million in the 1860 census. As much as 20% of all Americans were enslaved in 1800, with 40% of all Southerners, that is 1 million enslaved versus 1.5 million non-enslaved, being slaves. The market value of slaves represented 250% of national income from 1790s until abolition in 1865. To quote Piketty, the combined value of farmland and slaves exceeded four years of national income. Southern slave owners in the New World controlled more wealth than the landlords of old Europe. Let that sink in a moment. More wealth than the landlords of old Europe. That is a staggering historical finding. Slaves were generally slightly less economically productive than free wage labor, on average cost about 2,000 USD, and was estimated to have a rate of return of about 7%. Slavery was legally abolished in 1865 in the US, somewhere between 1833 and 1838 in the British Empire, and definitively ended in 1848 in France. Another claim Piketty makes in his book is that there was the rise of the managerial class in the late 20th century and early 21st century in a way that was unprecedented. To quote, the vast majority, 60 to 70 percent, depending on what definitions one chooses, of the top 0.1 percent of the income hierarchy in 2000 and 2010 consists of top managers. So that is pure bureaucrats. By comparison, athletes, actors, and artists of all kinds make up less than 5 percent of this group. So when you think about wealthy people like pop stars, movie stars, etc., that these constitute less than 5 percent of the group of wealthy people in modern times. Probably the most significant part of Piketty's book is his discussion of wealth inheritance. He defines the annual flow of inheritances over the long run as the total value of gifts and bequests over a year, expressed as a percentage of national income. So for example, in France, from 1820 to 1910, inheritance flows account for 20 to 25 percent of annual income every year, dropping to around 10 percent just after World War I, dropping still lower to 8 percent in the 1930s and 1940s, and increasing linearly in a modest fashion until about 2010, sitting at 14 percent of national income. So you can see these movements given the graph with the red arrows. It's Piketty to advance the following mathematical equation to try to model this. So b sub y is equal to mu times m times beta. The definition of each is as follows. b sub y is the proportion of national income inherited. Mu is the ratio of average wealth at time of death compared to that of the living. M is the mortality rate in the country per annum. And beta is the capital income ratio. So here's an example using data from present day France. Mu is equal to one, mortality rate is equal to about 2% per year. That is 2% of people die every year. Beta is equal to 600%, that is the capital income ratio is about six. And B sub Y therefore has the value of about 12%. So in France, where the average life expectancy in the 21st century will be eight to 85 years, the adult mortality rate will stabilize at less than about 1.5% a year compared with 2% in the 19th century, when the life expectancy was just over 60. The increase in the average age of death increases the average age of heirs at the moment of inheritance. In the 19th century, the average age of inheritance was just about 30, whereas in the 21st century, it will be somewhere around 50 or so. So this helps to explain why it is that wealth inheritance drives wealth inequality in modern times. More philosophically, Piketty claims that taxation is preeminently a political and philosophical issue, perhaps the most important of all political issues, of which I actually agree with him. And there are four aims behind his progressive global tax on capital. The first is to reduce wealth inequality. That much is pretty straightforward if it's progressive. Secondly is to increase transparency of records and accountability. This is less clear. So if you think about it, in order for you to have records of wealth inequality, et cetera, the best way to do that is actually to tax people and force them to keep records and to report them to government. And in doing so, typical citizens should be able to access that information so long as the government is transparent with that data. The third aim is to help fund social welfare programs. Fourthly, this disincentivizes tax havens. So Piketty's bold enough to make some conjectures about what such a global tax on capital might look like. For example, he says, the optimal tax rate in developed countries is probably above 80% or so. 
And yet he hedges by saying, well, no mathematical formula or econometric estimate can tell us exactly what tax rate ought to be applied to what level of income, given this rather utopian idea for a progressive global tax on capital. He nonetheless claims that this would not lower productivity of the U.S. economy to impose such a tax. He furthermore says that it would not be too radical considering that its purpose is not so much to raise tax revenue, as the latter would require impositions of at least 50% on incomes above $200,000. So in that sense, it's not necessarily to fund the social welfare state. It's more instead to mitigate wealth inequality. This, of course, would require international coordination and could potentially render tax havens non-existent, such as in the Cayman Islands, the Bahamas, etc. And countries could impose tariffs of, let's say, about 30% or more on the exports of offending states, that is, states that participate in helping their citizens put their assets into tax havens. So this is Piketty's proposal in a nutshell. Lastly, he says that a progressive tax on global capital can help to reduce public debt. Thanks everyone for watching this video. I hope that you learned something about modern wealth inequality in the last 150 years. If you're interested, consider borrowing Piketty's book from the library or even purchasing it. Don't worry, I'm not sponsored by Piketty. I have no relation to him, never met him before. If you are interested in more book reviews and summaries of natural and social scientific texts, including economics, political philosophy, physics, etc., please like and subscribe, and more content will be on its way. Hope you have a great day.